scripture. So it's from Isaiah chapter 60, the first six verses. Arise, shine, for your oar light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes, look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. Would you join me as we pray? Oh God, we are filled with your breath of life. It reminds us that your spirit is within us, filling us with your courage and your power and carrying us our prayers, our hopes, our dreams, our wounds, our sorrows to you. We ask you in these moments now to push away our chores and our work and our tasks and our worries and all the challenges that are before us, that we might rest in your word, we might wonder about your word, we might listen to your word and help it guide us today and tomorrow and the next day, and the next day, and on. Be with us, O God. Move us, O God. Fill us, O God. Amen. If you have uh, spent any time working with children in church, uh, in vacation Bible school, in Sunday school, or if you've been with youth to church camp, you might recognize a portion of this. We'll see how it goes, if I can do it. So rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, children of the Lord. Well, this is part of a song uh, from its, I, I forget its actual name, it's the Noah Ark song, and you sing these between the chorus of the story of Noah's Ark. But this chorus, of course, comes from this text in Isaiah, Isaiah 60. Give God the glory, arise and shine. Now, I have to tell you, um, it is often used in retreat settings and church camp settings, uh, even on mission trip settings as your wake-up call. Because on every experience with children or youth or even adults, there are morning people. And morning people delight in having this as the wake-up call. I mean, they just leap from their beds and they are so ready to go. They are singing, they are happy. And so for them, rise and shine is really exactly what they're doing. And if you're not one of those kinds of folks, you know, you just kind of roll out and you, you try not to be too hostile and surly, uh, but you, 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 you get through it. I have to say, I am not a person who arises and shines from bed in great delight. I'm kind of a slow person. I just kind of get up and I occupy my space, you know, we do the animal care and everything like that, and Carrie does his thing and I do my thing, and after a while and coffee, we actually talk to each other. It's just handling the fact that morning has arrived, uh, and I have to say I do not jump out of bed and go rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Isaiah 60 has amazing a passage, beautiful poetry, beautiful, beautiful words, is not about being a happy, cheery, peppy person. 
in the morning or actually at any other time of the day. Isaiah 60 is much more than rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. The vision that Isaiah is giving us is so much bigger and so much larger. It's cosmic in its vastness. It's cosmic in its reach. God's love is for the world, the entire world. And God's care is for every creature in the world. And God's hope is for every, every being in the world. We are starting in this time of worship thinking about resilient faith. Faith that holds on in the face of mess, of pain, of sorrow, of difficulty, of problem after problem. And we could all take the time to to tell about those times in our lives. We're going to be wondering, we're going to be walking our way through this conversation with God and God's word to remember, maybe to relearn, to learn for the first time what we might need to rest upon, to move with, and to move forward in faith with God. There are plenty of opportunities to see uh, darkness these days. We are again in this pandemic that's raging all around us. Uh, how do we live? What do we do about that? How can we be safe? I think it's possible for the political situation to become more difficult and entrenched, but I, I pray that that won't be the case. The complexity of work in businesses and restaurants and stores and banks and schools, in preschools, I, can they get even harder? I don't know about that. I'm going to suggest to you in these next uh, few weeks that we listen to scripture tell us about resilient faith, that we wonder about how scripture can help us uh, live closer to God, with God, a faith that endures, a faith that actually even begins to thrive for ourselves, for each other, a faith that can help us hold on as we navigate the days and weeks the year that is now before us. Have you ever heard anybody say or to you, just read scripture and you'll feel better. You'll find the answers, you, your questions, the answers to your questions are there. I'd have to say um, sometimes that works, but there are plenty of times when you, you don't feel like you heard the answer and you, you know any more about what to do than you did beforehand. I wonder though if God has other, something else in mind when we might be wondering or when we might be struggling. I, I think God's project isn't for me to feel better uh, or to get, uh, um, to get through stuff with a simple scripture passage. You see, God's project is the redemption of the entire created order, and it comes from God. It's illustrated, I think, I think we can understand it when we think about it, about it like this. Think about the difference between optimism and hope. You know, optimism is the sunny dream that tomorrow will be better. And even more than that tomorrow will be better, it's that it's up to us to make it so. You know, we can, we can do it. I don't think God is an optimist, my friends. I think God is about hope. Hope can hold together even if tomorrow is worse. Hope trusts in the larger, longer future. And hope knows that the future is up to God, not up to me or up to you. Ours is, um, as the text from Isaiah puts it, is to stand, the standing in our lives, in our souls, is about dignity, is about readiness, is about eagerness to see the light of God and to be ready to move in response to the light of God, to see God's work and respond, 
to shine the light of God even when the moment isn't good and the next moment is not likely to be good or tomorrow is not likely to be good. Isaiah tells the people to, that you're called to rise up, you're called to shine as a response to the glory of God, as a response to the light of God arriving in the midst. The Isaiah is telling the folks the world is it's been in darkness and it's I think Isaiah is wanting to remind the Israelites in this time and us today that God does something about darkness God spoke these words to a downtrodden nation in the midst of successive foreign rule by Assyrians and Babylonians and Persians and Greeks and Romans and God said arise let your light shine. Of course, the light that's shining in them is God's light. Today in worship, we're marking Epiphany, which is January 6th, Thursday, January. This week, it's Thursday. And Epiphany is a day in which we recognize that nations knew the Messiah had come and that people were sent to bring near to uh, that the Messiah was had come to bring people who were far off and bring them near to God to rescue from sin and death all who are struggling to deal with death and injustice and to shine a light to all the nations Isaiah 60 has to be more to us than the prophecy about gold and frankincense and myrrh being brought to the baby Jesus, I think it really speaks of God's longing, longed for future. When a light will shine out from me and from you and from all of us together, letting people know of the love of God and the hope of God and the future of God and that justice and peace will reign. And the light, Isaiah is hoping that the light will be so bright and so attractive, so warmth, so filled with hope that people will come to it. People will be drawn to it. In this part of Isaiah, the prophet uh, really fills the page with these beautiful, glorious promises. There's imperatives, God will, must, do, with these affirmations. You know, we're told, arise, shine. Who are the first people that hear these words, arise, shine? They're broken people. They're hurting people. They're discouraged. They're worried. They're depressed. The problems for the Israelites of returning from the Babylonian exile had worn them down. They felt insignificant against all of these oppressors, governments, and powers and bureaucracies. And in the midst of that, they had trouble getting along with each other. Sounds like now, doesn't it? Just like now. They seemed in deep trouble. And into that moment of time, the prophet Isaiah calls the people to arise, to arise from their despair, from their worry, from their fighting, they should arise. These affirmations that just come one after another, the world and its people, Isaiah tells the Israelites, it lives in darkness. Uh, the translation that I had read this morning says darkness and then thick darkness. It's just kind of trying to help us understand that there's a cloud over the people and it's troublesome. The cloud, the darkness, it kind of represents the separation of the nations from God. In the glory of the Lord, we are told, will rise upon the people, will come upon the people. And even though that people might be saying, God, you're so far away, you're distant, I, I don't hear you, I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to live, and I'm exhausted, and I'm struggling... God says, you're going to experience my glory. My presence will be with you. It will be available to you. And that people who have actually seemed to have the upper hand 
are going to come to you to receive the light of God. There's more to this passage than just some information about the Magi and when they visit the baby Jesus. Really, this passage reverses the way we expect God to work and to act. Usually we hear scripture exhorting us and pastors exhorting you to take the light to the world. Go out and be the light. I, I say it a lot. I tell you it a lot. But Isaiah promises that, is that the world will come to God's people for light because they find their darkness so oppressive. What Isaiah is telling us is that we are filled with God's light. And as we arise and stand in the midst of hard, hard, hard days, the people around us in their struggle will come looking for light from us. We can proclaim from Isaiah that God is at work in the world right now because we are filled with the light. If we lift up our eyes, if we arise and do the work of being a follower of Jesus Christ, we will begin to see and experience and know again the ways that God works to dispel the darkness of the world. God is actually at work in the world before even we as the church begin our ministry. Isaiah is telling us that we have the grace and the hope that the world needs. We have grace, we have hope, even if tomorrow is going to be worse. Eugene Peterson's message uh, uh, says it like this, get out of bed, Jerusalem, wake up, put your face in the sunlight. God's bright glory has risen for you. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All the people sunk in darkness. But God rises on you. His sunrise glory breaks over you. Well, it's certainly true that weariness, weariness wear upon us. And when we feel like we are in darkness and we struggle, it's really hard to look and to listen and wonder where God is and what God might be doing. But Isaiah says to us, you're filled with God's light, so stand up, rise up, and grab onto that hope. For you see, hope can hold it together, even if tomorrow is bad. Hope trusts in the larger, longer future, and that future is up to God, not up to me, not up to you. Ours, as the text puts it, is to stand and be a reflection of what God is doing. A preacher said this, Today I'm, re I'm recommitting to leaning into Jesus. One of the greatest temptations in Christian life, the moment we enter the darkness, is forgetting what God has promised us in the light. On several occasions, I admit that my anxiety, my fear, my utter confusion got the best of me. It left me clutching and controlling my life as if God did not exist, as if God would not show up, as if God didn't see or care. In a word, I forgot. Isn't that true of all of us? When things get hard, we forget. You know, every one of us can chronicle all kinds of countless examples of God showing up for us. Maybe it was a timely email when you were at the end of your rope. What about a phone call, a text, an act of generosity that helped fill a need? A worship experience that sent you out with the belief, the passion, and the power of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Or the unexpected success of a moment when you just stepped out in faith because you had no idea what was going on and things worked. For better or worse, there are seasons when we hold on to our faith and then there are seasons when our faith holds on to us. In those latter instances, I am more than ever thankful for all the saints, past and present, who said yes and whose faith sustains mine. 
You see, our role is to sustain, to live in hope, to arise and to shine the light of the Lord so that when someone needs to be held in hope, we are ready to do it. God is holding us and has always been holding us. We just forget. And when we forget, the darkness becomes even more powerful then. Isaiah not only reminds us that God is working still, Isaiah invites us to be a reflection of the light and the love and the work of God, the salvation of the Lord for all and for anybody who's living in darkness. Oscar, Oscar Romero was the Archbishop of uh, El Salvador. He was actually assassinated while he was serving Mass. And he said these words, When we leave Mass, we ought to go out the way Moses descended from Mount Sinai with his face shining, with his heart brave and strong to face the world's difficulties. Tomorrow might be worse. But because God has come near and God has filled us and the world with light, we can go out shining, brave, and strong. Amen. So now I invite you to uh, take your candle, go light your world, and as God goes with you, may God's peace surround you and keep you. In the name of Jesus who loves us. Amen. Now it's on the screen now. There's a covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition that I'm going to pray. All of us together, all of you can pray with me if you'd like. Uh, this is a prayer based on a prayer that John Wesley wrote to observe the new year, the coming of the new year. Churches used to have what they called watch night services. They'd gather at midnight on New Year's Eve, and this is a prayer they would pray together. I'm no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. Amen.